Perfect. So thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, today is our fun little chat about Riesling, which happens to be one of my very, very favorite, uh, favorite wines. I know that I have definitely done a, <laughs> um, I'm definitely doing this particular uh, class because I happen totally selfish reasons because I love it. Um, but it is Riesling and Riesling is just one of those things that kind of, you know, I feel like it's misunderstood. Um, so this is the one that I'm drinking right now. It's the Von Winning an amazing German Riesling from the Falls area. We'll talk about where that is. But um, Riesling is just sort of one of those grapes that's super hard to understand, but I feel like once people get it and once people kind of have the opportunity to experience it, they really, really fall in love with it just as much as, um, as I do, I think. Riesling, we are talking of course about, yes, John, Finger Lakes Riesling, I love it. <laughs> so we've got, um, we've got basically a grape. Uh, that we're talking about today, just in sort of a series of varietal kind of um, fun chats that we do. But uh, this grape is so special and so unique, I think, in particular, that I'm really, I'm really happy to talk about it. So what is Riesling? Um, Riesling is a, is a white grape that is native to Germany. Um, so we talk about the German Riesling as sort of being the benchmark, which we'll talk about today too, but it really, really is. And there's a variety of different um, regions within Germany that do produce Riesling. It, it is sort of the most, um, the most fantastic kind of um, diverse opportunity to try a Riesling in its native state, if you will. <laughs> but it is a grape that is very, very misunderstood. And that has to go back to a long kind of misunderstood history about Riesling in general. So when we're talking about the origin of Riesling, you know, just like the rest of the grapes that came out of uh, of Europe, the, all of our wine grapes of the Vitis vinifera varietal, they used to be wild, they would grow wild, and then were ultimately um, cultivated and planned and planted so that um, they could be, wines could be made for, uh, for local consumption, production, and then eventually exportation. So the wines of Germany have always been very, very highly regarded, and the Riesling grape has been their primary varietal for most of that time. Um, when we talk about Germany, you'll know, but uh, one of the things that sort of happened a little bit uh, was that in the mid-1980s, late 20th century, there was a very, very big sort of shift in uh, styles of wines that people were kind of paying attention to and interested in, in um, pursuing and drinking, and so you ended up with um, this sort of era of oak. Um, some of you may know what I'm talking about, but there was sort of a standard across um, all wines everywhere that this idea of adding sort of new French oak and the flavors that you get with that were kind of uh, indicators of very high quality and the best of the best. And so this was very challenging for Riesling because as we're going to learn, it is not a grape that does very well with oak, as it turns out. Um, beautiful, Charlene. I love it. Dr. Lucin standard, classic, classic standard. Um, and so the, um, the Riesling grape itself sort of suffered at that point because uh, it didn't do well with oak. And there's also sort of a very, very wide ranging um, misunderstanding that Riesling is always sweet. So if I could see all of you right now, I'd be like, hey there, who thinks Riesling is sweet? <laughs> Right, I see Fred and Cheryl right there, right. So we've got definitely some, some interesting things about Riesling are that it is a, one, it's a grape of extreme versatility. So when we're talking about the styles of wine that you get from the one single grape, it can be bone, bone, bone dry, or it can be very, very lusciously sweet. And it all just depends on how it's made, where it's grown, and what the kind of soil and terroir is like. Um, and also the choices that the winemakers are making. Um, so there's a huge range of styles that depend on a huge range of factors, of course, but we've got a, um, an extremely versatile grape that is not, by any stretch of the imagination, always sweet. Um, Riesling also kind of went through a period of time though where uh, the exported wines out of Germany were actually kind of a little bit more, um, <laughs> they were actually being exported as sweeter wines specifically. There was a particular style of uh, wine called Liebfrau milk, um, one of the funnest words to say, yes Daniel, Liebfrau milk, <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> I mean, right, like, it's kind of interesting, like, you kind of think you want to try a Liebfrau milk, right? Because you're like, is it, is it what? Is it milk? It's sort of this very, very sweet, um, very, very low alcohol kind of uh, quaffing wine that came out of Germany. Blue Nun, absolutely, Don. Blue Nun was sort of a, a benchmark of that particular style coming out of Germany. But you have this sort of, um, what that ended up kind of doing, it gained a lot of popularity, but then also sort of flooded the market in a way that um, people didn't realize that Riesling wasn't always like that, um, that the German wines weren't always like that. And German wine eventually became synonymous with sweet wine, which is absolutely not the case. So 
but Germany is sort of the home, the home grounds, the home, home ter territory for the Riesling grape that we're talking about today. Um, in the 21st century, now, we are definitely, in the past 10 to 20 years even, we've seen a huge, huge resurgence in the popularity um, of, of Riesling with consumers, with sommeliers. It's, it's kind of a darling of the market because it is extremely unique. Um, it is extremely, like I mentioned, versatile in terms of, of production styles, but also in terms of food pairing. So lots of psalms will give you like right away, they'll be like, ah, just go with a Riesling. Um, because nine times out of 10, there's a good chance that it's going to work with what you're eating, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's just got this incredibly gorgeous gorgeous specific and and characteristic aroma quality and for those of you i'm sure i have a few people out there who know exactly the word that i'm going to use to describe riesling anybody anybody aroma petrol guys petrol it's the weirdest descriptor ever i think yes petrol um it's like but it is it is one of the the key characteristic um uh aroma markers for most rieslings um and it's very interesting that you can actually, with Rieslings, the most amazing thing about it is really it's a grape that's able to express very, very nuanced individuality based on where it's grown. So based on the soils and the terroir that that Riesling is, is being um, uh, grown in, you have very, very distinct flavor profiles and styles, yet somehow you're always, always, always able to tell that it's a Riesling. So that is a very, very special and unique characteristic about the Riesling grape. So moving on, things about Riesling. Um, so we've got uh, Riesling in the vineyard. It is as a grape, technically, technically speaking, we're looking at an early ripener um, that thrives in cooler, cooler climates. Now it's very funny because even though um, Riesling tends to be uh, considered a late ripener in Germany, it's pretty much early ripening everywhere else because Germany is a, is a colder, colder climate. Um, you have basically, uh, as a vine in the vineyard, it tends to be very, very vigorous. So what does that mean? It means that it likes to produce lots of green. It really, it really likes to produce leaves and produce lots and lots of grapes, which leads to higher yields. And as we know, we've talked about this before, higher yields means more grapes and more grapes does not equal better grapes. In most cases, and for Riesling as well, you have, have the reality that by reducing the amount of grapes that your vines are producing, they're actually pro producing higher quality grapes, right? So what's interesting is that Riesling is not only planted in the Mosul, and we're gonna talk, or in Germany, I should say, but we're gonna talk about the different areas that it's planted. Overall though, um, it doesn't succeed very well in hotter climates. So everywhere that we do see Riesling planted is generally going to be a cooler climate or in a, in a warmer climate, it's going to have mitigating uh, geographic factors like altitude or, uh, or other, um, other geographic factors that help to retain coolness for the grape to ripen because it wants a really long growing season. That's the other thing, not just a cool growing season, but it wants to take its time. Um, this grape really likes to develop slowly. So when it's in hotter climates, the grape will ripen faster and you lose a lot of the integrity and nuance of the, the varietal characteristics of, um, of um, Riesling if it's grown in a hotter climate. So it tends to be very, very picky about that in, its, in thriving in certain particular climates. Um, one great thing about the, uh, the, the beautiful thing about Riesling, one of the many things I'll say that 80,000 times I'm sure during this presentation, <laughs> But it does have uh, qualities that make it very, uh, all other qualities that make it very good for cold regions. That is, um, the wood of the actual vine itself is very frost resistant. So it does very, very well in colder weather, which is part of the reason why it has become such the signature grape of Germany in a climate that's generally considered much, much colder and tends to have a lot more frost because we're basically right at the threshold of ripening um, uh, latitudes up there. So the, the ability for the, the actual wood on the Riesling vines to be able to resist frost is hugely, hugely important for the grape. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned, this amazing ability for Riesling to be able to uniquely transmit um, individual terroir characteristics within the um, experience of the glass. So that you can have Riesling grown from two sites of two very different soils by two different people, um, be able to make very clear distinctions on why they're different, but also be completely 
without question, knowing that it's Riesling. Um, very other few grapes have that ability. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon is one of those, for example, that does have kind of that ability and actually grows in more places. Um, and Riesling, it's a little more challenging to get in that international level in terms of availability. And then what's also interesting is that the grape itself, it's not a very thin skin, a thick skinned grape, but when it's in warmer climates, the, the skins will actually get thicker. So in those warmer climates, you're also going to end up with some more um, phenolics in those wines. They also will tend to have a, um, more body, more alcohol in them, just because the grapes will get more ripe and there will be more sugars in the grapes when they're picked to be made into wine. But the actual skin of the Riesling grapes will also start to thicken and toughen up. So for example, this grape is grown in Germany and in Australia, two very different climates. And the skins of the Riesling grape can actually be up to seven times thicker in Australia than they are in the Mosul in Germany. And so that is a huge, huge factor in the resulting characteristics of the wine itself, right? Because it's going to add again, those kind of bitter phenolics. It's going to add texture. It's going to impart um, different aroma and sort of more, um, more uh, just, aroma and flavor characteristics out of the grape skins themselves versus just the must. So also super interesting. Um, the other thing that does make Riesling very, 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 very special for very, very um, special types of wine is that it is particularly able to produce, um, it's prone to something called noble rot. And I promise someday we're going to have a whole other class on this because Whew, I can't even get into it right now, but um, it's something called botrytis. And long story short, it is a, a rot that attacks the grapes and desiccates them by sucking out all the moisture so it concentrates the sugars. And then the resulting grapes when pressed have a much, much higher sugar content ratio, right? So these wines tend to be made into those very, very sweet um, elegant dessert wines, but are more expensive and harder to make. They can only be um, they can only be made from grapes that have been affected by this particular type of rot, and that only happens in very special conditions. So it's not all the time. In the winery, Riesling, as I mentioned, um, it is not a fan of new French oak. So in the 80s, when that became the height of fashion, uh, Riesling was not on that bandwagon. It was definitely, definitely taken a back seat. And so that is because, for a couple of reasons, Riesling is what we call an aromatic varietal, right? It really has very, very, um, uh, active and vibrant aromas that will jump out of your glass. So if all of you do have some Riesling in front of you, which I hope you do, because I'm just happy for you to have that, um, you can probably notice that you'll get aromas that will come out of the glass and you can probably smell it without having to stick your nose all the way in the glass. So I hope that's true for most of you, but it's kind of, that's how you notice the intensity um, when you're tasting wines. When you're looking at that aromatic intensity, you know, the farther away you can actually start smelling it, usually the more intense that aroma is. And Riesling tends to be fairly high, high intensity level um, in aromatics. And those kinds of wines, new oak will generally tamper that. Any kind of oak will actually start to reduce those, those aromatic components slightly because of the oxygen that's involved in using um, any kind of oak, even neutral. But in particular, new oak that imparts flavor. Um, new oak imparts flavors of uh, spices and vanilla and sometimes coconut or dill, depending on the type of oak you're using. Um, those kinds of flavors don't suit Riesling. They don't enhance them. They don't make it better. They kind of take away its uniqueness. So most, most Riesling is usually done with stainless steel fermentation and even maturation. Um, and this stainless steel provides a lot of intensity, clarity of focus, and just that pure, pure acidity. So Riesling is a grape that's very, very high in acid. I'm sure all of you can notice that as you take a sip. I encourage you to. Oh my gosh, I love Riesling. Oh, that's so good, you guys. <laughs> I hope you're all having the same experience I am. But this is, first of all, one thing you're probably noticing right away, your mouth is watering. As soon as that hits your tongue, basically all of your salivary glands are probably going, ah, and your mouth is gonna start to water. That's because Riesling as a grape is naturally very, very, very high in acidity. Um, and acidity is the thing that makes that kind of experience of your mouth watering. So using stainless steel fermentation and, um, and maturation means that you're not allowing oxygen to interact with the wine, which means that you are preserving all of that acidity and freshness into very, very sharply focused um, flavors and textures. So I hope that makes sense. 
but that's what the stainless steel helps to do. Now, large wooden oak barrels are also often used and historically have been used because they do a couple of things. Large, old, neutral oak, as we call it, does not impart any flavor, but it does allow a little bit of oxygen to come in. The little bit of oxygen will start to interact with that wine and it'll start to soften the wine. It can help reduce that acidity because sometimes I'm an acid head. I absolutely love more acid, the better. I'm all about it, but it can get to be too much. And a lot of people actually don't really like that. Um, a lot of people were not like me and did not suck on lemons when they were a child. Um, and if you are a person who does not care for that level of acidity, then Riesling is going to come off as very harsh and very, very, um, very, very direct and very, very unpleasant potentially. So neutral oak barrels will tend to soften that wine just a little bit and add a different kind of texture to it other than that kind of racy, racy acidity. And um, residual sugar. This is part of the thing why people often think of Riesling as a sweet grape or a sweet wine is because very often it does have residual sugar in it. But you might not even notice because the very, very high acidity that we've just tasted, that actually gets counterbalanced by the sugar. So residual sugar in a wine will actually help to balance the wine out. And you might not even taste that sugar. What it will simply do is kind of give rounder, fuller notes to the fruit that were otherwise sort of overwhelmed by the acidity. So a little bit of sugar is a very, very important component to many Rieslings to provide them with balance, but you won't necessarily taste it. Um, now, definitely there are Rieslings made with the intention of tasting that residual sugar, and we'll talk about those two as well. And finally, Riesling is not generally blended with other grapes. It is one of those grapes that really kind of focuses just Riesling all the time, all Riesling, go. So, so now getting into the different places where um, Riesling is produced, as I mentioned, Germany is of course our, our fatherland. <laughs> I really wanted to say that in German, but I don't know how to say that. But um, it is the birthplace and historic benchmark of Riesling. And each of the individual Rieslings within, or each of the individual regions within Germany kind of have their own, uh, you can tell where the Riesling is coming from uh, in Germany when you taste it because of how extraordinarily it transmits, again, the, the terroir, and also how very, very, um, Vater thank you, Fräulein of Wine, Vaterland, Vaterland, that is the name in Germany, in German for Fatherland. <laughs> so um, some of our main regions for German Riesling, um, kind of the, the epicenter, I would say, is the Mosel, um, which used to be called mosel saar um, It's named after the river, as all of the regions really are in Germany, uh, that goes through it. So the Moselle River, a hugely, incredibly, incredibly windy, windy river. If anyone has been there, it is an incredible place. The vineyards are just, they're planted on these like 45 degree angle um, slopes of these granite, granite soils, um, most of there. At least in, it's just this dark slate, I should say. Sorry, not granite, dark slate. And you have the, um, these very, very beautiful, elegant, sort of um, almost effervescent, but very, very ethereal Rieslings that tend to come out of the Mosul. They tend to be a little bit lighter. They tend to have a stronger component of lime, a lime citrus kind of, and almost that delicate, delicate slatiness. It's very, very strong in the minerality. Uh, these can be made, again, as all Rieslings can, from any range of sweetness, from bone bone dry to lusciously sweet in the Moselle. Um, other regions, the Rheingau, I would say, is probably your next most important region for Rieslings, although there are other regions that are definitely coming up to, uh, to those status as well. The Rheingau Rieslings tend to be a little bit more richer, a little bit fuller bodied. They're actually planted on the uh, part where the, um, the Mosel actually goes east-west. So the Rheingau, and you have uh, just pure south-facing slopes, which means they're just capturing all of that sunlight, as much of that sunlight as they can, and it's reflecting off the river, and the grapes of the Rheingau are able to ripen more fully because of that. So the, the, more, the more ripe you get your Riesling grapes, the sort of richer, fuller bodied, and a little bit more intense they become, right? So the Rheingau is sort of known for that type of style. Really, really amazing, very, very historic, have been grown there forever. Um, Rhein-Hessen is a larger region that you tend to see a little bit more bulk wine come out of historically, although they are upping their game quite a bit. Um, the Na'a, Na'a, 
Nahe, spelled N-A-H-E, very, very fun, um, is a, another region within, the, uh, within Germany that is known for, again, kind of richer, fuller-bodied Rieslings. Um, and then finally, I'm drinking, for example, a beautiful Riesling from the Falls area. So the Falls area is literally, if you were in France, which we're going to be next, uh, and you go straight north from Alsace, you are hitting just basically across the border into Germany or in the Falls region. And that is known for not just beautiful Rieslings, but there are also um, a lot of Pinot Noir grown there. Pinot Noir, another glass to <laughs> the main red grape of um, Germany and most uh, best known, and I put on the map there as well, in the Ahr and the Baden regions. But you do see a little bit of Falls making the Pinot Noirs as well. So when you're in Germany, there's a very, very particular <laughs> <laughs> organization system of quality, which I would love to get into today. Sadly, I can't because it's very confusing and very hierarchical, but some of you may recognize these words. Um, and it's called the uh, predicate wines. The predicate wines are basically an organization of quality um, in these different levels that I will, I will just kind of go through very quickly. But what's the important thing to know about this particular German wine law is that it is people often think that it means how sweet the wine is, but that's not true. It's actually how much sugar is in the juice at harvest. So what it is actually gauging is how ripe your grapes are. And why, why they did that was because historically it was so hard to ripen grapes that it wouldn't even get to 8% alcohol naturally, which is very, very low. So you were rewarded with how much longer you would leave your grapes on the vine to get them riper. And if you got them riper and made your wine from riper grapes, then you could get a higher quality level on there and therefore ask for more money. Um, but when you are making that wine, it's up to you if you're going to leave residual sugar in it or not. So that is why these particular levels are not based, they don't tell you how sweet the wine is that you're going to drink. They tell you how much sugar was in the grape at harvest. Big, big distinction makes a very, very important um, difference. But um, the levels basically go like this. Cabinet is your sort of entry level. This is the lowest um, must weight, they call it, the lowest amount of sugar needed at harvest. This is actually gets its name from the fact that German winemakers, it was their cabinet wine. This was the wine they used to make just to have in their kitchen and drink. <laughs> So it's basically always going to be very, very fresh, very clean, um, very, uh, very quaffable and ready to drink. Um, these levels can come in any, any level of sweetness. Sometimes they'll have a little bit of residual sugar in them. It's not uncommon. Um, Spätlese. Spätlese is our second level, and that actually means late harvest, because um, spät means late in German. And this is our second level, meaning that it has to be left on the, it's picked after the cabinet grapes. So these are left on the vine longer, and therefore they get riper. Um, Ausschlese is our next level after that. That means um, individually picked berries. So Ausschlese is this level where you start to go through your vineyard in Germany and you're starting to see that some grapes are ripe and so you pick them at different levels of ripeness. And that means you're individually, you can't go through with a machine and do this. You have to pick out your, your specific berries to use in this particular um, wine. And sometimes this is where you start to see a little bit of that noble rot that I was just talking about, that Botrytis, hi Lucas, um, that there, the Botrytis that's in there that can start to affect the wine by intensifying the sugar content and also adding a little bit of that kind of flavor. There's a very unique flavor that sort of smells like, um, like Bactine actually, that you get when you, you drink wines that have been affected by Botrytis. Um, so the Auschleza is sort of your, again, um, third level on that on that um, pyramid. Baron Auschleza means um, individually handpicked berries. And that's actually, that is the one that means individually handpicked berries. The other one just means handpicked. Um, and then you have the Trocken Baron Auschleza, which is dried um, individually picked berries. And these are your very, very highest level of, of wines. These are always Cibotritis in them. You will always have dried grapes basically that you're making wines out of that turn into these very, very luscious, or even um, when you're in Baron Auschleza and Trocken Baron Auschleza, they're always going to be sweet. Um, Auslaces and Spätlaces might be sweet, they might not, same thing with cabinets. So again, it has nothing to do with how much sugar is in your wine. Your last category of the German quality level is Eiswein. Some of you may know this, it's also, you know, Eiswein, which is this beautiful, yes, TBD. <laughs> um, the uh, Eiswein is basically a different way of making the wines where they leave 
the grapes on the vine and the grapes actually have to freeze on the vine um, without being having any of the botrytis on them. And then they press the frozen grapes, uh, which means that all of the water crystals go off to the side. And then the, what's left is basically a concentrated sugar grape juice. Um, similar to what happens with the botrytis, but without any of that effect. So ice wines are always very, very rare. You can't manufacture them. You have to wait for the perfect timing um, and the perfect weather. And then finally, those are always very, very sweet. They have very, very pure, clean fruit flavors. Ice wine, it's, it's a remarkably fun thing. Yes, it does. So this, um, in this particular picture too, when we're looking at grapes, this is a bunch of grapes that you can see where you have the individual dried berries and you have green berries on there as well. And so this is where individuals would go through and that they would go ahead and um, pick those very, very ripe berries out of the bunch, leave the green ones on there and let them ripen longer, right? So they're, trying, they're individually picking and it's so labor intensive, you guys. This is why these wines are very, very expensive. <laughs> Just FYI, don't be surprised if you go and try and get a Trockenberry now Slaza, which is spelled wrong on the slide. I'll fix that before I send that to you guys. But um, these are beautiful, beautiful wines. So moving on to other places where we find Riesling. Germany is really your benchmark, like I said, but I have to say I have a, a very, very soft spot in my heart for um, Alsatian Rieslings and Alsatian white wines in general. So Alsace is in France. Um, it's really against that border of of Germany and in fact has been part of Germany back and forth over a period of time quite a bit. So if you go to Alsace, you'll see that it's a, a culture of people who are very much a little bit of French, a little bit of German, but really they're Alsatian. They kind of very self-recognize themselves culturally as Alsatians. But um, it is a beautiful region for winemaking because it's one of the sunniest regions uh, in France. The Vosges Mountains are just off to the west and they actually stop all of the bad weather that's coming in from the Atlantic. So they have over, uh, like 300 sunny days a year, um, which is great for grape, ripe, grape ripening because also it's a fairly, generally speaking, cooler climate, which means that you have very sunny, but very long and a cooler growing season, which is perfect for white wines to develop full flavors, um, rich aromatics and beautiful textures. Riesling is considered one of the noble grapes, one of the four noble grape varietals of Alsace. Um, it is, it is a, beautiful to generally fuller body, generally dry Riesling. So if you like the drier style that tends to be more acid forward um, without as much residual sugar, then Alsace is going to be a great opportunity for you to explore that. Um, these wines are richer and fuller embodied, also a little bit pr more pronounced in that kind of riper citrus note, sort of your Meyer lemon versus like your, your key lime kind of notes, if you will. And these just tend to develop beautifully. Um, Riesling overall, because the acidity is so high, it ages very, very well. So you can keep a Riesling, pretty much Rieslings in general, like you, decades, decades we're talking folks. It's totally, totally valid. Most will hold out for at least five years and many, many will hold out for far longer than that. So Alsace is one of those places that is uh, probably one of your second most important regions for, for Riesling in the world. And then we're in Australia and you're like, how did that even happen? What are we doing in Australia? Sasha's talking about cool climates and then we're all of a sudden here at the, at the bottom of the world. Um, the, um, but Australia is, 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 it's a very, very small portion of the Riesling market, but what it does make in very two specific regions are very important. So um, ironically, which I found very, very fascinating is that Riesling was the most planted white varietal in Australia up until like the 90s. Um, it was it was a very, very, it was late in the 20th century when it, the plantings of Riesling were actually finally overtaken by the plantings of Chardonnay, which is very, it was very surprising to me to kind of learn that. But it was, it was sort of, it was being planted with, um, without kind of consideration for that climate, for the terroir that we need, right, to really produce the highest quality. So much of, of um, Australia is far too hot, but in the particular regions on this map, you've got basically um, the two very small valleys, the Clare Valley, and then the Eden Valley, all both of which are in South Australia, which is a state in, um, in Australia. And these two regions are known for their very, very high quality Rieslings because both of them happen to be in very high altitude regions. And so I'm sure most of you remember, yeah, remember me yabbering on about altitude and how 
the further, the higher you get, the cooler it gets, which means that hot climates can be mitigated and made ideal for grape growing just by going a few thousand feet up in the air, right? Easy peasy. But um, Clare Valley in particular is known for almost 1500 feet um, of altitude, which does a huge number for creating a cooler climate and also diurnal swings. So getting those nice cool nights to really capture the acidity and the freshness in the grape and, and lengthen that growing season a little bit. And Clare Valley is the further north um, of, of the two. And then Eden Valley is over here um, and it is, it's very similar in style. It's sort of described as lime 3D. <laughs> In terms of tasting notes, um, it tends to be slightly lower in elevation, about 650 feet, as opposed to the 1,500 feet that you get in Clare Valley. But you're still getting beautifully mitigated, really, really um, delightfully fresh, acid-driven, not as high in acidity as the wines that you get from Germany and Alsace. But still, as a grape, it's got the acid. It's going to be there no matter what. So... It is, um, and it has been, and so these two particular regions, Pusey Vale, if any of you are out there and you want to try a really spectacular, it's sort of one of the originals, um, the, uh, the um, original producers of the, of the region. So that is Pusey Vale. I know you can get it at high times if you're here in Costa Mesa. And it's a really great example of what Australian Rieslings kind of can exhibit and be. Um, yes, Canary Islands, altitude versus latitude. Uh, Lucas is just telling me that, uh, reminding me the Canary Islands, which are actually subtropical climates off the coast of, um, of Africa, but part of Spain, you can grow beautiful white grapes there because they have incredible altitudes of over 2,500 feet, very similar to Argentina as well, um, in sort of the higher, uh, the higher reaches of the, um, North and Argentina. So Austria, this is one of my, Austria is such an underappreciated country, I think, when it comes to wine, uh, because sadly, most people don't know about Gruner Veltliner, um, which we're not getting into today, but is kind of the main white grape of Austria. Um, however, their actual um, plantings of Riesling, while much smaller, are by no means less extraordinary. The Rieslings out of Austria tend to have an incredible intensity of flavor. So in this particular thing, um, you've got the Danube River that comes through the Austrian um, wine region of the Niederösterreich. Uh, and this is your sort of your main wine growing region where you'll find a lot of your Gruner Veltliners, but also your Rieslings. Um, it just so happens that there's kind of a wind tunnel that's created that comes down the Danube that that is um, the reason the particular growing, the vineyards around the Danube have extraordinary diurnal swings. So you get very, very cool nights uh, on these vineyards and very, very sort of sunny, sunny um, days a lot of the times. So the grapes here, the Riesling grapes are able to ripen very fully. So you get a lot of flavor um, and a lot of uh, sugar in there. So your alcohol tends to be higher, which means fuller body, but that intensity of flavor is, is, is even more direct and pronounced than those Rieslings that you get out of the Moselle. Um, it's just as part of the characteristic. They're not quite as high in acid as you get with a lot of German Rieslings and even the Alsatian Rieslings, but definitely higher than from uh, Australia, let's say, and very, very uniquely uh, concentrated and beautiful. Absolutely love them. So the, we've also got, of course, last but not least, and I'm so glad. <laughs> yes, Gruner Veltlin there, Gruner, guys. Gruner's, the, we'll do another class on that another time. Um, but finally, North America, we see our fair share of Riesling, which has really upticked quite a bit in the past 20 or 30 years even. Um, most of North America, a lot of our North American, when we think of North America, mostly we think about California, right? <laughs> but um, California does grow some Riesling, but the majority of the Rieslings that we're going to see, Oregon, Oregon has some Riesling. There's dabblings of Rieslings everywhere. But like I said, you need to have your, your right temperature, your right climate, and your right soils to actually make it taste good, to make it worthwhile, to make it a viable investment as a winemaker, right? So where they found the most success with that in the United States, of course, has been Washington State, actually. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have had, for example, uh, Chateau Saint-Michel is a very, very famous, popular one. But there are other very unique um, mesoclimates within sort of smaller regions within the Washington state area that produce extraordinary Rieslings. Uh, and we're looking at a picture of the Finger Lakes right now, guys. This is New York, um, known for some of the most spectacular Rieslings on the global stage. It's insane when you try them. And I find them to be very similar, I feel, to, um, to when we think of that in uh, your Australian or even your Austrian Rieslings, where you have a richer sort of more vibrant, uh, kind of uh, 
intensity of flavor of fruit that's a little bit riper, uh, like those Meyer lemons and a little bit more of those beautiful kind of um, uh, peachy tones almost. And the acidity is still right up there, but you get that lovely kind of petrol note that we were talking about, that kind of steely, steely quality, um, just rich and beautiful and very, very tasty. Uh, <laughs> oh, wonderful. I see that. Uh, a Washington State one. Obelesso, beautiful. Thank you, Vicki. Um, and we've got Sandra, that's your hometown. You're from Syracuse. I mean, I, I was so shocked when I learned about the Finger Lakes region and I have not yet been there. I'm actually planning on going there as soon as I possibly can, but um, the Rieslings in particular from here are extraordinary. Forge, Forge is a, Forge Cellars is a wonderful one. Absolutely. Um, I've had several of their wines and I quite love them. Um, and then finally, Canada, of course, also does offer like uh, the, a beautiful, beautiful example, uh, especially in particular the Ontario regions and in particular ice wines. Although a lot of Canadian ice wines are made from a hybrid grape that's actually called Vidal, but you'll still see Rieslings as well there. Um, and Petrol, I am going to talk about that a little bit because I've mentioned it just a couple times. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that uh, tasting note, Petrol, um, the way that it's very unique. And once you kind of smell it and taste it and, and identify it and make that little uh, note card in your brain, it's hard to forget. But one of the ways that we talk about it is actually um, uh, thinking of it as Petrichor. Uh, and the the best way to describe it is it's hard to do in California because it doesn't, doesn't rain a whole lot here. But going out onto the street after there's been a heavy rain or a downpour and smelling the air and that kind of um, electric sort of metallic -y kind of petrol -y note is what we talk about. So petrol like gasoline, but it's not actually like a gasoline smell. It's a little bit more distinct and and not quite as um, as burning as that. It doesn't burn, but it has this sort of very, very electric kind of minerally quality to it that is different than any other kind of mineral aroma. I hope Fred and Cheryl, that's helpful. Did that work at all? No? Yes? Eh? <laughs> um, rain on a hot sidewalk. Yeah, exactly. Sort of just beautiful. The older the Rieslings, exactly. The older the Rieslings you try, the more kind of pronounced this petrol aroma is, especially in the German Rieslings. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of addictive. Once you've had it, it tends to be you crave it a little bit because it doesn't really exist in other wines. It's really just in beautiful, beautiful Riesling. So, um, I, I highly recommend for everyone to continue drinking lots more Riesling until they figure out what that is. <laughs> um, and then finally, enjoying Riesling. Uh, it's very easy for me to say, like anytime, obviously, let's, uh, let's all drink right now, um, which is, again, why I did this webinar. But the idea that um, Riesling is good with so much food, and in particular, it's great with foods that are hard to pair. That is things like, um, like Thai food or Indian food or spicy foods. Generally speaking, spicy foods are the worst to pair with because most wines tend to be kind of overwhelmed by the intensity of the spice. But um, Rieslings, and in particular Rieslings with just a little bit of residual sugar, are perfect with any sort of heat and any sort of chili heat because it kind of tampers down the heat a little bit and lets you taste the chili spice, the spice instead of the heat. So um, that is why it's great with sort of those Asian cuisines and, um, and spicy uh, ethnic cuisines. Uh, it's also amazing with fish, with oysters, with cheeses. Um, you can just run the gamut with all sorts of vegetables, which is generally a hard one to pair with too. Um, citrusy vinaigrettes that are lots of usually high in acid and hard to pair with. I mean, honestly, I, I challenge you to find the thing that doesn't taste good with Riesling. And I, you'll end up drinking a lot of Riesling, I promise. <laughs> um, only white wine that works with duck. I mean, I would absolutely drink this with duck. It, there's something about the texture, the acidity, and just the uniqueness of Riesling that makes it exceptionally versatile when it comes to cuisines. Um, the, cool, the, the amount of intensity of flavor and aroma also means that you can, you can serve it chilled, and you should serve it chilled. Uh, it tends to uh, do its best when you, you share that, um, you kind of extend it that way. Uh, so you have a um, lovely, uh, ability to chill it down very, very cold and still appreciate its nuanced textures and flavors and aromas, which is really good. Yep, asparagus, artichokes, all things great with Riesling. Um, decoding the sweetness level. So either, either you're a person probably who likes residual sugar or maybe doesn't like residual sugar, or maybe you just want to know if there's residual sugar in your Riesling. One of the trickiest things to figure out. I'm going to give you two hints. 
One, look at the ABV level. So generally speaking, the higher the ABV level, meaning like 12.5, 13 and above, it's probably going to be a dry Riesling. Um, that's because that's roughly the amount of alcohol produced when all the sugars are fermented into alcohol. So if you see a Riesling, if you look at the back of the bottle and you check out the ABV and the ABV says 8% alcohol, chances are there's gonna be residual sugar in that. Now, as I mentioned, that doesn't mean it's going to taste sweet, but you'll just know that it will have that balance of residual sugar. The other thing that a lot of winemakers, um, both in Alsace, even in Germany, um, and in many, many other places where they're producing Riesling, they put a little sliding scale on the back of the bottle. Some of you, if you have your Riesling, you can even turn it around now, usually New World and also, like I said, Alsace. But it's basically like a sweetness of meter. So that it'll say from dry to sweet, and they'll kind of give you a little sliding scale so you can be like, oh, it's not quite dry, but it's not quite off dry. So it's somewhere in between, which means there's a little bit of residual sugar, but not a lot. So could work, right? Um, and then finally, like I mentioned, don't be afraid of little RS. Uh, even if you think you don't like the sweet ones, give yourself a chance to try as many different styles of Riesling as you can, because again, it's always surprising, always nuanced, and literally every single bottle is going to be different and taste different and be a new experience, which is why it is such a absolutely, absolutely beautiful, gorgeous bottle of wine to share and drink. So thank you all very, very much. I really, really appreciate you all coming. Gosh, it's so great. Uh, it just thrills me to death. So um, at this point, as usual, I'm gonna now cross my legs, sit back and ask you if you have any questions. <laughs> I know, cheers, cheers everyone. Let's just get that most important part of the day. Yes, temperature and humidity are at extreme ranges, changes the grape. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, Basically, uh, cool climate versus hot climate is, is kind of twofold, right? It's, it's the rate at which it ripens and, and how fully it ripens, right? So cooler climates, generally, it takes longer to ripen and they don't get as ripe as quickly, right? So you might not even get to full ripeness. Whereas in hot climates, you'll, you sometimes might be, end up picking raisins without meaning to because they've gotten so ripe um, and that sometimes, you know, they can even get overripe. Um, so yeah, that is kind of, you have to be more conscious about that in hotter climates about when to pick it to maintain acidity levels, which start to drop as your sugar ripeness starts to get higher um, to keep your wine balanced. Um, I wanna thank you all again for coming. I hope to see you all next week for our traditional method, sparkling wine extravaganza and um, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Happy weekend, stay safe, stay healthy. I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Okay, bye.